Good evening, everybody. You are watching America First. My name is Nicholas J. Fuentes. We've got a great show for you tonight. Joining us this evening, we have a very, very special guest. I think we've been on a few streams together before, but this is his first time on the show. Mr. Mediker, how are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. Having a good uh, a good Wednesday. I hope you're having a good one as well. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, and it's great to have you. It's uh, You're one of the most requested guests that our audience asks for, and we've got a huge lineup this week, so we're glad to have you. And yeah, it's been it's been an okay Wednesday for me. I, I was up all night last night. I was going to go out and distribute these Papa John's flyers, but the buddy who I was going with, he, he got new dogs or something, so he, he didn't want to go all the way downtown. So had to shut it down. I was sleeping all day. And I only woke up a couple of hours ago, but but we're excited to have you here, and, and it's going to be a fun show. It's going to be high energy. And I believe the first time that we spoke, because you've never been on the show, but the first time that we spoke was on that Lauren Southern stream with Destiny, correct, back in the fall? Uh, yeah, that that would be reaching back there, but I, I believe that's I believe that's the first one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good times, good times. Well, yeah, like I said, it's it's the first time we've really interacted kind of one-on-one -on -one here. I know you're more of like a YouTuber. I'm more on like the proper political side of Twitter. Um, but one of the first things I want to talk to you about, just, just really briefly, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but we were both on the Ralph Retort stream last week or two weeks ago. It was Ralph Retort, and he was having on Paul Nealon, and I think Patrick Little was on there briefly. And I know I jumped on there. Everybody, I think, saw it. And it got pretty nasty pretty quickly with me, but then I caught you. I think you came on immediately after, a little bit afterwards, and you kind of gave him the the proper Medicare interrogation. I would, you know, I think you were fair enough where you can't really call it an interrogation. Uh, but I, nevertheless, I thought, I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was very cordial uh, with uh, Mr. Nealon. Uh, but yeah, just listening to his answers and kind of uh, hearing about his political stances, I found it a little strange uh, that he would consider himself a counter Semite and then have a Jewish manager. And then, you know, advocate kind of a, a core white family unit. And then he's married to a Mexican woman. So I, <laughs> right. thought that, I thought that was a little weird. So I just, you know, I kind of asked some questions relating to that. And then some basic, I guess, political stances of his. We didn't, we didn't get a chance to talk too much. Maybe about 20 minutes or so. Right. Yeah, I, I caught it just a little bit ago. I watched the, uh, the whole thing. And what I'm just fascinated by is the fact that we've got this Internet coalition. I think this is what you were stressing on that show was that we have this large internet coalition of largely anonymous people, you know, and especially during the 2016 election on 4chan, on Reddit, on the various image boards and social media. There was a real political force. I mean, you look at a guy like Ricky Vaughn in, in the case of Paul Nealon, it's a pretty good contrast, where somebody like Ricky Vaughn, who is anonymous, was able to affect this great, great political change as one individual anonymous Twitter account and I thought it was just a very interesting compare and contrast between the people that are out there and they're basically poll incarnate. And they consist of all the memes, all the talking points, all the, uh, you know, some of the absurdities and paradoxes of it. And I just thought that was a very interesting contrast, the effectiveness and, and the look of what it's like in real life running for office as these two candidates were or what it was online. I mean, do you think there is something about uh, the the fact or the nature of being anonymous, of being online, that in this day and age is, is more effective politically? Because I just thought that was a very interesting idea that you kind of brought up with him. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I break my answer down into two parts. One, yeah, I think anonymity online definitely played a, a crucial role. It's a, a large factor in, I guess you could call it propagandizing. Mm. Uh, they're able to get a message out. Uh, they're able to deliver a, a concise message in a way that resonates with people. Uh, and really, it comes down to who's funnier, uh, <clears throat> the better the better memes, I guess. Uh, but that that helps facilitate getting a message out for a candidate. I think that played a large role in the election, you know, from anti-Hillary to pro-Trump. I, th I think that definitely had an effect, and I think anonymity helped. If you're identified and you try to do a lot of what was done, you're just going to get hammered into the fucking dirt. <laughs> I mean, we saw that with... Uh, the kid that uh, tweeted out, it was like a, a wrestling gift that was altered. It had Trump in there, and CNN was right on him, saying that if you do this, we're going to release your information and write up a story on you. But because you promised not to do it anymore, we're going to sweep it under the rug. We're going to forget about it. As far as, uh, you know, the viability of candidates like Little or Nealon, I mean, they, I don't want to try to 
undercut the effect they had. I mean, Little was running in California, correct? Correct. Yeah, and I mean, people will make fun of him, say, well, he only got 1% of the vote. Well, you couldn't go to a more liberal, democratic, blue fucking state than California. The fact that he even got 1% is impressive on its own, coupled with the message he was preaching. It, it really actually surprised me. And I think Nealon got, was it 15% against Polanyi in 2016, or am I am I wrong on that? Uh, well, yeah, but that was before he went full red pill. He was more of a, a MAGA pede at the time. But, but you're right. I mean, nevertheless, 15% in the primary. Right, right. And I think when you were talking to him, you brought that up, didn't you? You said, you know, people were out door knocking for you. They were getting your message out there. And then you kind of changed change stances after we kind of got your name out there uh, to the point where that 15% that was built up might be jeopardized now if you were to run in the future. Yeah, that's right. Completely evaporated, I'm sure. I, I know the people that I was one of the door knockers and I knew the people that were uh, among them and the people we were knocking on the doors of. <laughs> I know the uh, the new message would probably not appeal as explicit as it is, right? Uh, maybe not in, uh, that's Wisconsin, yeah? Yeah, yeah, uh, the first district. Maybe not as much in Wisconsin, but uh, again, I mean, it is interesting that they were able to take in the numbers they could. Uh, what would Nealon pull in the future? I don't know. If Patrick Little changed his message, will he pull in more of a a percentage? Probably not. But, uh, you know, again, 1% in California. <laughs> With the <laughs> message that he had is, that is, in my opinion, a victory considering what he's fucking dealing with in that particular state. Right. Yeah, it was an interesting experiment. And, you know, uh, I, I do think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he ran as a civil rights advocate, you know, because I imagine in a state like California, it's obviously the largest state, I think, by population and a large minority population. Well, it's I don't even think it's fair to call the minority in California the majority. You know, it's a, a minority white state running as a civil rights advocate. I think that that was actually an intelligent, a clever kind of a trick, but but definitely inter an interesting experiment. And and I bring it up the uh, the nature of anonymity and these kinds of things because I think that's a big part of people like your effectiveness and other YouTubers, other people that are making change, because you see what people are up against like myself and others who are out there and we've got our faces out, once you kind of manifest in the real world, once you can be identified and you have liabilities and things that people can look after or go after, I think it becomes a much different equation in terms of how you're able to parse out your message. I mean, do you think that's a big part of it? I think that's true to an extent. I mean, take you, for example. You're 19, right? Mm -hmm, correct. Uh, I mean, you already have a Wikipedia page. True. Like, your online footprint is cemented. If you were to try to go anonymous past this, that's always going to be there. Mm. You know what I mean? Once you kind of come out and you, you kind of askew and throw away the anonymity, uh, whether it's willingly or unwillingly, um, it, it's, it, anonymity is almost like uh, virginity. You know, once once <laughs> right, you get right. fucked, there's no one fucking it. <laughs> so once once it's out there, it's done with. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I find anonymity to be an important integral part of the Internet. I mean, it has been since its inception from message boards to image boards and onward. I mean, it's always been something that has allowed people to speak freely. And when you take that away, it just it, it seems like a bad idea to me. I, I know a lot of social media platforms, a lot of uh conglomerates and corporations want to strip it away. Facebook and the Twitters and all of them want as much information as they can get. If you want a Gmail account, you need to give them, you know, your your phone number. And before that, it was an address and a name and just ridiculous amounts of information because for some reason, they're terrified of the idea of an anonymous user base. I mean, you can see this in comment sections on websites from news sites to even scientific journals where they've, uh, you know, either done away with anonymous comments or they're asking for a real ID identification to actually be able to post comments now on certain websites. So there's there's a change taking place, and I don't think we should be pushing it along. Mm. I think we should be dragging our feet as much as we can and enjoying it while we can, because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, kids growing up on the Internet will probably look back and be like, holy shit, you could be anonymous online? That's <laughs> fucking wild. Yeah, well, it's true. And, and I think why that's so integral is because of how the system is. You know, Well, we know that's why... It's so integral is because we are in a place such that if you go against the mainstream and even it's gotten to the point where, and this is something I think you explore in a lot of your videos, if you're not on board with things that are 
absolute lunacy, that things 10 years ago would have been thought ridiculous. You're the subject of ridicule among peers, among employers, among other kinds of people. And so it's almost a necessity to express a dissident opinion. And I really wanted to get into this kind of a subject because we're at a point right now, and this is kind of the broader topic I wanted to talk to you about, is we're at a point right now where this dissident movement, and I don't even want to describe it as right wing or left wing, but just really kind of dissent against whatever like neoliberal kind of postmodern atmosphere we're in, where we're kind of at a weird place in this area of dissent. I think this is something a lot of people are feeling because in many ways, I think we were all unified in 2016 and people like yourself, people like me, people like even Neil and people like the alt-right or the alt-light or even ostensibly establishment right-wing people were all kind of on the same team. We were all against the SJW type. We were all against that kind of thing. And now it feels like there's a lot of confusion. It feels like people call it infighting, people call it counter-signaling or punching right or whatever, but there isn't really a clear idea of, of what the direction is, what we're going for. And so I look at somebody like yourself where I don't think you're necessarily a totally political person. I think all of your, most of your YouTube content is for entertainment, it's for humor, um, and I, I see how you interact with JF and others, and it's it's mostly just about how do we get laughs, how do we get views and drama, and, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. But we're forced, people like yourself are forced, I think, to almost take like a quasi-political stance in this day and age, right? And so I just want to kind of, I just kind of want to get an idea, pick your brain a little bit about what you think the state of this movement, if you could even call it that, is right now. Because I, I'm, I'm feeling like we're very confused at the moment. Well, I, I would hesitate to call it a movement or even use, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a bit of a cold, so you have to bear with me. Oh, sorry. Or even use something like uh, we. I mean, you've got so many different groups that kind of came together to accomplish a, a pretty specific set of goals around 2015, 2016. You saw a really hard pushback against SJWs, which I, th I think we kind of saw in multiple ways. But you also saw kind of a push in politics. Uh, you know, Trump represented this idea that he was an establishment. He was going to drain the swamp. And so you had all these different groups kind of come together from, you know, an image board like 4chan to something like Reddit, where it's more user based and, you know, there's more ID tied to it. So it, it's these different communities kind of commingling to accomplish something. And then once that thing has been accomplished, infighting usually is going to take place. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to comment on it because I don't identify as it. And it would feel kind of dickish for me to sit here and say, well, you guys should do this and you guys should do that when I'm not you guys, you know, sitting here and chastising you or giving you pointers on what to do. But, I, you know, I, I think you'll find more cohesion, I guess, as the next election cycle kicks in. And people will set aside whatever their, their differences are for that moment, at least, to do something. Um, but I, I think it speaks to the perceived threat of this kind of super hyper-liberal SJW leftist mentality uh, that these kind of groups could even come together in the first place. And now that they're kind of dissipating a little bit, I think it, it, it kind of signals that at least there might be a bit of a shift taking place where even regular people at this point now recognize that you know, holy shit, uh, these liberal professors are fucking crazy. These students that are coming out of universities are a little nutty. Uh, corporations have taken it too far with their policies. And I think that that's made people relax a little bit because now they don't feel like we have to put up a unified front and, uh, you know, go after this because now more people are recognizing the same shit they recognized years in advance. I guess that would be my take on that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I do feel like there is kind of an opening. And, and this is something I saw or something I've been seeing a lot is people kind of reanalyzing the Trump election, reanalyzing 2016 and saying, you know, it wasn't so much about Trump. In many ways, there was a political impetus for somebody like Trump in the sense that people were outraged about immigration, people were outraged about trade, but generally it was just an anti-establishment. It was just a, a negation of what was happening as opposed to a positive vision of well, it's, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Trump, but I feel like generally speaking, it was more of a cultural rejection of the establishment. And I think that's a good way that you phrase it in terms of, or even regular people were saying, we don't want this hyper-liberal system, and, and if that makes us bedfellows with the right wing, if that makes us bedfellows with 
These people who are saying extreme things on image boards, well, you know, we're we're all kind of working against the same people. We all, you know, the enemy of the enemy is my friend sort of a deal. And I do think that we are making a shift in a big way. It's kind of difficult, though, because you see that there is a shift taking place. And, and at, by the same token, while I think people are moving away from this kind of political correctness, social justice mentality, by the same token, I think there is like a counter-reaction or a counter-revolution by the establishment that's taking place. And I think you've covered a lot of these topics. You talk about like the bully hunters. You talked about, uh, I saw your Pokemon video about the Bulbapedia or that, that Pokemon thing. Do you, feel, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you feel like there's like a counter-reaction happening against that? I feel like there, there's almost this frenzy on the part of the left because they sense that this is happening. Yeah, I mean, they're they're trying to claw and dig their way back. Yeah, I mean, I think they notice a shift taking place, too. And so you're kind of seeing, uh, well, I mean, as they put it, the resistance, you know, mm -hmm. this ridiculous notion of we're going to fight conservatism or the alt-right or anything that's not us uh, tooth and nail on any platform that we can. Um, you kind of see it popping up. But I think when you start to see a cultural shift take place, whether it's to the left or to the right, once that begins, you can't undo it. And the left can kick and scream all they fucking want. But it, once it kind of starts to do that shift, you've got a good, I'd say, decade of breathing room as that shift takes place. I mean, they could go march in the fucking streets. Antifa can dress in black and break windows. They can throw tantrums on universities. But I think the general populace has become familiar enough now with it that they just look at it with almost kind of a disdain or disgust. And I think the kids growing up, uh, you know, younger ones in elementary and junior high kind of look at it and they're like, we, do, we don't want to be like that. These people are the, the ass end of every joke on the Internet. We don't want to be made fun of to that degree. Right. Well, yeah, no, that's what really gives me hope. I've been talking a lot about this on my show. I gave a speech about it, Generation Z. I'm a big believer because, you know, we tend to look at Hollywood, us us older people. I'm, I'm technically Generation Z, but I don't know. It's kind of difficult. I was very either late millennial or earlier Generation Z, so I still kind of remember what it was like before the ubiquity of the Internet. But I think older people tend to look at Hollywood. They tend to look at television, legacy media. But if you look at what's on the Internet, whether it's someone like PewDiePie or the various Twitch streamers or, or the kind of things that they're consuming, it's it's not necessarily political, but it is, as you're describing, this kind of cultural resistance to just the horrible things that are happening on the left that are just obviously objects of ridicule. So, I mean, do you see the same kind of hope for Generation Z that I do? Do you see the same trends, or do you think that's kind of a myth? I, well, I think when you start to do generational analysis, right, um, one of the things that always fascinated me is a lot of people like to blame the boomers, but mm. I, I think a heavy burden is, should be laid on the shoulders of Gen X. Mm. I think Gen X, you know, the lot, or latchkey kids, that kind of generation, were almost apathetic. They kind of just fucking tuned everything out. Uh, and so they weren't as active or empathetic as they should have been to the current climate and just kind of let things metastasize into this overgrowth of cancer that really just overtook the millennials. Um, that, that would be my first thing. As far as Gen Z, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I see a lot of crazy stuff happening. If you look at gaming, if you look at something like Overwatch that has a ton of players, I mean, they're banning toxic players. They're, they're setting up policies where if you say something mean about somebody outside of the game, they'll ban you. Uh, you know, you look at a platform like Twitch where most of these kids go to watch their content. And, you know, a Twitch streamer is basically held at uh, gunpoint. They're yeah. a hostage to the terms of service that are on that platform. So I, I think that Gen Z is aware of that as they watch these, you know, different content creators that they like. And they watch because, you know, they're not really doing anything political. They're just telling jokes. And so they're watching and they're thinking, well, why is this guy getting banned? Or why is this guy getting censored? Or why is his, uh, his stream getting pulled down? Or why are they fucking with him? And it probably, you know, starts to build up feelings in them of, well, that's fucking gay. So again, it <laughs> kind of plays back into that original point of they don't want to be like that. I don't know what their politics are going to be, but I don't think they're going to be a PC generation. I don't think they're going to be politically correct in any way, shape, or form as we've known it previously. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it's it's interesting because as somebody who's Generation Z, you can kind of see the difference where online the behavior is somewhat different, at least for, for my class, you know, people around my age, than the in real life behavior. Because a lot of, you know, it's, it's tough because I know a lot of people who watch this show, many of them are Generation Z, and they'll say, well, some of their friends are very PC, but some of their friends are not so PC. I tend to see online, it's it's very much uniform. 
that it's against, and IRL, it's a little bit different. But but anyway, I, th- I think we've talked enough about that subject. What I really wanted to uh, pick your brain about this week, this is this is the hot topic on everyone's mind, which is the uh, the James Gunn thing and, and all that's going on in Hollywood. Justin Roiland, Dan Harmon. I mean, how perfect is it that we find out the Rick and Morty television show, the two co-creators, and I think everybody could kind of see this if you knew Dan Harmon, if you've ever seen him before, you know, that they were going to be these kinds of sickos. I mean, what do you make of all this? Uh, Do you think that there's actually something going on there as somebody who is a humorist yourself? Do you see it as jokes? I I think I can kind of guess your take on this, but, but what are you feeling this week? Oh, well, with like uh, Harmon and Royland or whatever his name is, the Rick and Morty guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw the baby rape uh, video that Harmon did, and I saw, I think it was uh, like an image or a video that Royland made of uh, Baron Trump naked. Yeah, right. Play- playing VR or doing something weird like that. <clears throat> uh, my personal opinion is I don't think they're pedophiles. Um, I-, I think it's just really shitty, edgy humor. Mm. Um, now... What I do find interesting, and I think this plays a lot into what we're seeing right now, is for a very long time on the internet, if you made a joke that was even a little bit racist or homophobic or transphobic, and you're on the right, what's going to happen? They're going to track down where you fucking work, they're going to track down your name, and they're going to get your ass fired. They're going to try to just ruin your life. And now I see that being turned around on them. It's like using the same rules of war, right? The right was subjected to this for years on social media platforms. If you told something that was a little off color, but it was just a joke, no, no, you're a racist, you're a homophobe, you're a transphobe, we need to deal with you. But now the left is facing that. People are digging through timelines, right, with Harmon and Royland and all of that. Right. And they're finding these examples of, if it is humor, humor, and saying, oh my God, look how terrible this is. These these people make uh, cartoons that kids can watch. They work for a big corporation. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. And I see all these leftists bitching about it. And I'm like, where was your outrage when that was happening to people on the right? I didn't see you uh, standing up for Milo Yiannopoulos mm-hmm. when he was making edgy jokes at uh, McGill Gorilla, or what the fuck her name is from Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah. right? right? I didn't see you jump in and say, no, no, it's just humor. Relax. No, you wanted his ass exiled from Twitter. So I, I find that uh, a bit funny, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, irony in that. As far as James Gunn goes, I don't know what's going on with that. Mm-hmm. I saw some fucking crazy tweets. I think... Um, Mike Cernovich had archived some right? because he went through, didn't he delete like 10,000 tweets yeah, or something? 10,000. 10,000 after the initial like 25 or whatever were exposed. Oh yeah. No, uh, people should be aware that people in media, uh, Hollywood, TV, movies, cartoons, all of that, they're scared shitless right now. After that Me Too stuff, they are looking over their fucking shoulder. So if you find anything that's even remotely uh, questionable, uh, they're going to shit bricks. So it, it, it kind of makes me curious if people are going to start digging through celebrity timelines and Instagrams and Facebooks, because I'm sure you'd find all sorts of shit on there. But I mean, even a more recent example, wasn't it uh, Roseanne Barr made an a, a edgy joke, a racist joke, and uh, her fucking show was stripped away from her? Yep. So, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of sympathy for Dan Harmon bitching that people tried to get his show ripped away from him for making, uh, you know, a, f- a baby fucking joke. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, it, it seems what's what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I saw somebody, some journalist, some effing journalist who said, she was like, oh, well, when right-wing people were making jokes and Nazi jokes, the right was like, oh, it's just humor. But now when the left does it, they're all over us. It's like, no shit. Because every time we do it, whether it's Roseanne Barr or even if it's somebody, you know, I think back to like 2012, Mitt Romney, he said like binders full of women. And do you remember how people seized on that? Like to me, that was like, to me, a perfectly appropriate phrase, by the way. But let's say you're some kind of political consultant. It's like, well, it doesn't sound quite right, you know, but they took that and they made it's on Wikipedia now as one of the major blunders of the election. You look at that, you look at things that we say, which are completely innocuous. And these people are making jokes uh, of like where Dan Harmon is simulating the rape of a baby, where James Gunn, Michael Ian Black, and it's not like a, a few jokes in these cases, it's like 30, 40, dozens upon dozens of jokes about molesting children. We call them out, we get them fired, and, and then they suddenly cry foul. Exactly, you know, what's good for the goose, good for well, the Well, it, it's not even just blatant jokes, right? Mm, it, it's you know. The left likes to use the term dog whistling. Right, So right. even if something is perceived to be potentially offensive that's problematic if you're posting a pepe you must be a deplorable you must be one of those alt-right neo-nazis we need to get rid of you 
So, you know, <laughs> again, I don't have a lot of sympathy uh, for the left. And also, I, I guess I should apologize. Your chat said this is a family friendly show. So I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to tone down the F bombs for the soccer moms listening right now. That's it is. It is a family. You got to imagine, Jim, it's families huddled around their television screen. They've got America first tuned in on the dial. They're sitting around with their TV dinner. So you got to keep it PG. I'm sure many people have uh, many of the families have told the kids to go go to bed. But uh, no, uh, yeah, it's, I'm it's sure they're, they're terrified, yep, huddling around asking their parents what those mean words mean. But <laughs> yeah. I'll try to move past it. Right, but, uh, well, no, that's a great point that you make about dog whistling because I can't tell you how many times, because I watch my language very carefully. I've grown up in the PC generation. Like, when I was in elementary school, if you called African Americans black, you were called a racist. This was the environment I grew up in. And so I watch very carefully what I say. But I can't tell you how many times I've gotten an interviewer or somebody who's filming me for something or some journalist tell me, well, you might not say bad things, but are you aware that the people watching your show are racist? Or, well, the KKK said the same thing like 20 years ago. Or, you know, people who are racist might like your content. And then when it comes around with these people and they're making jokes about molesting children in the case of Justin Roiland, drawing pictures of children's genitals, oh, it's all it's all in good humor. You know, it's all jokes. Yeah, it's, it's all fun and games. You know, that, that leads me to another uh, point, I guess, kind of semi-related to this. You remember mm. the adpocalypse and all the YouTubers mm. that were flipping out about the loss of revenue because these advertisers mm. had seen videos that were extremists, as they put it. Right. And they wanted to censor what they were. They were not, I shouldn't say censor. They just wanted to have more say over what they advertised on and wanted to be sure that certain things were taken off the platform. So it, it amazes me that a company like a Nike or Adidas or a Pepsi or a mm. Coke yep. would have that much say in YouTube. But then when I'm thinking of, you know, Harmon and the advertisers on his show, where's their outrage that he's posting baby rape videos? You know, where's, where, where are they saying, hey, wait a minute now? If we can't let that uh, that alt writer uh, put up a a risque video on YouTube, we probably shouldn't be backing and supporting financially the guy putting up the baby rape videos. Right. Well, and even with uh, with Rick and Morty, the perfect example is Sam Hyde, where Sam Hyde's million dollar extreme was on Adult Swim, and they were wildly successful in their first season. I think they had a million views on their first show, a million views on their last show. Was it like three a.m. after? Eric Andre. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was really good. I actually really liked that show. And I think a lot of what that came down to was, uh, I got a, a Tim Heidecker. Yep. I yep. think I think Tim Heidecker absolutely went behind the scenes. I think Tim, uh, Tim Heidecker uh, used his connections to get Sam Hyde thrown off that platform. I, I, I truly believe that. I think he undermined him. And I think he was, you know, integral in getting him uh, kicked off. And I think it's, it's crap because uh, I think the show was good. It was bringing in mm -hmm. a lot of viewers. And... Uh, it just, it, it's ridiculous, but kind of all around in my opinion. Well, yeah, I mean, the hypocrisy of it in that case where, and this was a funny show. I mean, I, I was showing this to my mom the other day. We were sitting around watching World Peace, and, and this was a great show that has influenced, I can't tell you, thousands and thousands of people. I was just thinking about it this morning. I don't think you could find a single right-wing person on Twitter.com who's comedy or their humor has not been influenced by Sam Hyde. And if it wasn't, it's shit. If it wasn't, they're a boomer and they're making jokes about how Obama was a Muslim socialist, you know, that kind of thing. And so you look at that case where, and obviously there were extenuating circumstances there, but, but just on the face of it, where Sam Hyde, there's hidden swastikas, which is total nonsense, but they say, oh, it's a racist show. So they kick him off. No opportunity. He's blacklisted. You'll never work again. In the case of Dan Harmon, completely okay. I don't know if he made a statement, but Adult Swim said, yeah, he's cool. He'll be able to keep making Rick and Morty. And it just tells you the the inequity. It just tells you what we're up against. But, I mean, that. what do you think about Tim Heidecker, though? Just on a side note, do you think he's funny? Because I, I don't really get the Tim Heidecker thing. Um, you know, I, I, I liked uh, some of the stuff he put out uh, kind of on, a, uh, I guess, early Adult Swim because mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a new thing. Um, yeah, and in the beginning, I thought, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Tom Goes to the Mayor was pretty good. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things, uh, and I'm not saying that Tim Heidecker is a hero here, but it's the only saying I can think of. They say, don't meet your heroes. Mm. Um, you know, I probably would have continued thinking Tom Goes to the Mayor is pretty good if I didn't encounter what Tim Heidecker was like outside of his uh, media that he creates. Because uh, he's kind of a, he's kind of an asshole. Right. right. And uh, it kind of ruins the, the content, the media that he creates. Because then I think, 
I can't stop thinking of him behind it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, I, maybe that's the same way for me. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of my, my take on it, at least. Yeah, because I see his comedy, and I think if you compare that with Sam Hyde, I think they, Sam Hyde does it better. It's kind of the same style. Well, it's um, I don't know about the same style, but the same kind of tone, the same ironic kind of theme. And uh, I don't know. I just never really got it. But, but yeah, no, this, uh, this pedophile thing or the double standard, I think those are kind of two separate issues. On the one hand, it's the pedophilia, which I'm sure goes on in Hollywood. And then on the other hand, it's a double standard. But this has been oh, really... I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that it goes in, uh, on in Hollywood. I mean, you had people like Corey Haim. Uh, mm. Or no, which Corey is it? They're the, not Corey, Haim. It's, uh, is it Feldman? Feldman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, constantly talk about it. And he, he finally released one name. I can't remember what it was, but it was a guy that worked uh, kind of like an extra mm. on, I think, Lost Boys and another movie that he worked on. But he, he talked about it uh, being kind of uh, almost prolific in the industry. I think even Yiannopoulos commented on it, saying mm. that he'd been to some Hollywood parties and seems, uh, uh, seen younger boys, teenage boys at these, uh, and that it made him uncomfortable. Uh, you know, it, it, it most definitely is something that goes on. There's most definitely a culture related to it. Um I really thought with the Me Too thing, we were going to see it break into that, but it, yeah, I guess it's too entrenched to really be dragged out into the light just yet. I, you know, this is why people for years have been making jokes about Dan Schneider. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, it, it's almost, it, it kind of reminds me of um, Seth MacFarlane, right? He made a lot of jokes about sexual assault on his show regarding certain celebrities. And then it, you know, because it was at that point where everybody's joking about it because everybody knows it's true. And then it finally came out that, yeah, it is true. Right, so right. kind of related to the pedophile culture in Hollywood, I, I think we're at the point where everybody's making jokes about it because everybody assumes it's true. And eventually something's going to cascade that out and we're going to be like, wow, you know, I, I never would have thought so-and-so was involved in this. Because I'll tell you, a year ago, I never would have thought that Kevin Spacey would be sitting next to a, a guy, uh, you know, a valet and whipping his cock out and saying, boy, it looks big, doesn't it? <laughs> but, you know, color me shocked. Nope. It fucking happened. I'm oh, sorry. It happened, didn't it? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, that's the thing is I think everybody knows that it's going on. And it's it's a weird thing that you bring up where it is this double think of at once. You know it's happening, but at the same time, you exist in a state where you're not totally convinced or maybe not totally conscious of it. I don't think it really hits home with a lot of people, but you're right. Then in the case of Me Too, it was, well, I mean, we know that people are sleeping their way to the top. We know there's probably rampant abuse, and it was joked about so much, and then we found out, oh, it's Bill Cosby, it's Kevin Spacey, it's you know all these people, in many cases very famous people. My fear with the pedophilia thing is that it's, pervasive all across many industries. That's really my fear. I mean, I'm really terrified that one day we're going to find that like half the members in Congress and people in government and people in Hollywood and all over the place, because to me, I think about the actors and I don't mean actors in the sense of people who act in films. I mean, like individuals in these institutions. I think of these actors as people who are eccentric, as people who have lots of power, people who have lots of clout. And you think of the kind of individual who's in these positions, and you think, well, they have pretty eccentric tastes in in many cases. And so you think about these different characters where they get off on the power, they get off on this weird kind of stuff, they basically run the world, and I think it's almost impossible that there wouldn't be that kind of parallel thing going on child trafficking human trafficking because these people who are in these positions they say well i should have whatever i want and of course that's going to include sex and maybe it's maybe it's like just women you know as was the case with me too or maybe it could be a little bit more evil than that and so so that's well, really yeah, my I, thing I, I have no doubt we'll probably eventually encounter a you know a weinstein version for kids you know what i mean mm. um and i think you're right i mean they it, it I can't really name you many child actors that grew up okay. And mm, I think for yeah. a long time people said, well, that's just the result of being exposed to fame. But is it? I mean, is it that these kids were exposed to fame and money that drove them to be insane? When you look at like Amanda Bynes, when you look at Jamie Lee Spears, who got pregnant at like 12. Right. When you look at a Macaulay Culkin, who is, it looks like a, a zombie, a walking corpse. When you look at these people and their drug issues and their sex issues and their broken home lives and eccentric behavior and mental illnesses, is that really just a result of fame and money or is there a bigger component to it? Are they being exposed to predators that are basically taking advantage of them every single day? And, you know, you'd have to imagine the, the kind of psychological impact that would have on you. 
that you're famous for being on TV or in a movie, but every time you look at that TV show or that movie, you remember the guy that got you the job who you had to have sex with or who molested you. And I could imagine that driving you crazy by the time you're 18 or 20. Absolutely. I think, well, and it's every case. It would be one thing if it was a few isolated cases of child actors going off the rail, but it's, I mean, it's literally every single one. And it's a very interesting transformation. This is something I've noticed in particular where it always follows exactly the same pattern, which is to say that there is this period of they're a childhood actor, they're doing great, particularly with Disney. And then they get this weird phase. This happened to Miley Cyrus, Selena Gomez, Taylor Swift, all the rest, where they hit the mature phase, and then it's a BDSM music video. In every case, how many times have you seen, and I've seen it enough times where I've noticed it, that it goes from sweet young girl making music to suddenly there's rubber involved, there's there's a whip, there's a BDSM thing. And to me, that can't be a coincidence. I mean, that, it's a, when you a little start bit of to... a, a signal flare for you, is it? I mean, yeah, Miley Cyrus, didn't she have a music video where she dressed up as a baby and talked about kinky sex? I, I think so, yep. Yeah, and that was, and the the reaction to that was really funny because if if I remember right, when that first came out, the the dislikes were just massive, mm -hmm. and the amount of comments from her fans were like, "What is what's going on? What is this?" Right. And you know, it was just another another produced music video that was in line with her her transformation from wholesome, uh, you know, American teenager to just drug abusing degenerate as an adult. <laughs> Very sick stuff. Well, hopefully we'll find that. I mean, what did you think about the Pizzagate stuff? I have to ask because I was a big Pizzagate guy and I know a lot of people doubted it at the time. They said, oh, really? They're running like a sex trafficking ring outside a pizza shop. I was a big believer at the time. But now that this stuff is coming out, I mean, were you on the bandwagon back then? Does it change the way you think about it now? I mean, what was your take about all that? Uh, did I believe that there was a secret child prostitution ring hidden under a specific pizza shop? No. no. Um, did I think that there was some really strange stuff going on? Absolutely. Uh, the artwork that that particular owner had was mm. very interesting. The people he was connected to had some very bizarre tastes. Um, I remember that he gave an interview uh, to a news outlet where he was talking about how they were claiming that he had a basement. Yes. And he, did, he didn't have a basement. But then in another interview, he said, I do. He, he, they were like, where do you keep your, your items stored? And he's like, oh, in the basement. So, you know, you put that together and you're like, wait a minute. You just told one guy you don't have a basement. And then he told another reporter you do. And you've got all these people that think you're in the middle of a, a you know, a child porn empire. Maybe get <laughs> your story straight before going on the evening news. And you want to have people showing up with a gun outside your restaurant yeah. thinking that you're running a child porn empire. Oh, and, and that was my only conviction during the Pizzagate thing is I don't think anybody knew exactly what was going on there, but it just, there were so many things that did not add up. And that was one of the biggest things for me. It was a BBC interview where he said, oh, we don't even have a basement. And then in a totally separate interview, he said, we get our tomatoes shipped in and we like do something with them every day in the basement. And I was like, something's so wrong here. And then what I found out just recently was that and did you know this? The guy that went in with the gun in the police report, it said that he went in, he found a computer, and then he shot the hard drive. He ruined the hard drive in one of their computers. That's, that's what I've heard. That, see, that, that doesn't make any sense. If he was going to show up to get evidence, why would he shoot the hard drive? Well, exactly. It's, it, was it a false flag? Was it a PSYOP? Who knows? I mean, it just... It's a lot of stuff that just doesn't We're getting add into up. some Zapruder film stuff here. You know, that's a little right. back into the left with this. Um, but... No, I, 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 you know, generally where there's smoke, there's fire. Right. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of really weird stuff surrounding that. So I didn't come down hard on, like, I've made fun of, like, sovereign citizens, right? Uh, <laughs> right. People that are citing laws from the 1800s that aren't valid anymore. <laughs> Am I being detained? Right. Yeah, because I find favorite. that funny, and they should know better. Um, but with stuff like this, where you're looking at it, and there's there's some legitimately weird stuff going on, I didn't really come down hard on people because it's like, okay, well, he's giving conflicting statements. Okay, well, they've got art that's really bizarre. You know, they're posting pictures of some really weird shit. And, you know, maybe it's completely innocent, but it sure as shit looks guilty. So I, I didn't really begrudge people for looking into it. Yeah. Well, yeah, my buddy who I was in school with, he was the friend of mine who I used to sh I used to shoot the original America First show in his dorm room. And so we would talk about politics all the time. And he was a philosophy major. So he would always tell me, you're using inductive reasoning. That's not deductive reasoning. That's inductive reasoning. And that's why And I go, I don't care. It doesn't make any sense to me. 
and and there was the the WikiLeaks. It was all just very fishy. But I mean, or, do you tend to be conspiracy theorists? Because I find, at least for myself, and this was the big thing for me was during the 2016 election. They said Hillary's health was fine. They said there was nothing wrong with it. And in that moment, when I heard, I saw her collapse on 9-11. We saw the coughing. We saw all the issues. And despite that, the entire media, with the exception of Fox News, and there's also one other very interesting exception about Fox News, if you look at who runs it, which differentiates it from the rest of media, where I said, you know what? If there's like mass cover up going on with the media, with the government that, I mean, we see it's happening and they're telling us it's not. At that point, I really started to buy into stuff about Pizzagate, about Las Vegas, about all these other things. Do you find yourself believing in conspiracy theories or do you find that generally it's just a lot of nonsense? Well, you can't. I, I browse X, which is the paranormal board, and they me love too. conspiracy theories. I mean, I, I like me a good conspiracy theory. It doesn't mean I necessarily believe it. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'll give you a good example, though, of why you shouldn't dismiss it outright. Um, you talk to a lot of people nowadays about vaccines, and they, a lot of them get freaked out. They're like, I don't want a vaccine. I think it causes autism. Now, I don't believe that personally. But you, you, you follow up and ask the person a question. You'd be like, well, why do you think that a government organization or a corporation would intentionally make you sick? What benefit do they get from that? And they don't really have a clear, concise answer. But the truth is that has happened before. The United States government, using assets outside of the country, intentionally poisoned people with medicine to study the effects of syphilis on them. It happened to a group called, I think it was like the, uh, it was a group of African Americans, uh, Tuskegee something, I can't remember the exact name. But they injected them with syphilis and said it was vitamin C shots, and then they refused to treat the syphilis because they wanted to see what happened. And it went on for 30 or 40 years. I think Bill Clinton addressed it during his presidency and apologized for it. Uh, so... The U.S. government and corporations, they do do underhanded shady shit. And I bet if you went back in time and you talked to people and said, hey, don't get that vitamin C shot, they're giving you syphilis, people would probably be like, oh, you're crazy, man. That's insane. But the government has done some really wild stuff before uh, because it furthered their goal because they wanted to get information or they wanted to test something out. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was it for me, really, is that's the central point because most people hear a conspiracy theory and I think that's the impulse. People don't really look into it. People don't even really consider it because they say, well, conspiracy theories by by the very connotation are outlandish or fringe. It's crazy people that tell them. And who would be more reliable, your own government or some wacky guy on the internet? But for me, it all really fell apart when they eliminated the benefit of the doubt. Once you lose the benefit of the doubt for the media, for the government, once you understand either by historical evidence or you look at something happening now that the government or the media is willing and able to lie or inflict terror attacks on their own people or inflict disease on their own people, then I think it's a totally different ballgame. I think it really just changes the way people think. So it's not so much like, well, I'm a conspiracy theorist now so much as it is, well, we have to give a fair hearing to the government story and to the and to the alternative theory. And that really changed it all for me, as I said, you know, we, we can no longer believe everything that we hear from from the establishment. Well, I, I think a lot of people that have used the Internet at this point, regardless of the generation, have kind of started to take on the idea that the onus is on them, mm -hmm. that you can't really trust anything right. anymore, um, whether that's the media, the government, other you know, users on the Internet, a social media platform. Because it always seems like we're getting lied to about something. So it's not really far-fetched to think that a lot of people doubt what they're told, uh, regardless of who the source is or what the information might be. Sometimes that leads them to believing foolish shit. Uh, but a lot of the times it's, you know, it's not uh, a harmful thing to be doubtful or to want to look into it. I mean, you really are responsible for yourself for figuring out stuff. You can't take anybody or anything at face value anymore. Uh, we get lied to constantly by everybody. You really have to put the effort in. Uh, to find the information yourself, parse through it, and come to your own conclusion. Uh, so that's kind of the stance I take on it. So, yeah, I like uh, conspiracy theories. They're fun to look at. Um, some I give more credibility than others. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't really, I guess, dog on people too much unless it's something so insane and far out there like a flat earth uh, that I, I can't treat it seriously. You're not a flat earther, you mean? Oh, fine. No, no, I'm not a uh, flat earther. I, yeah, I me would not neither. be a flat earther. I, I would find it hard to keep satellites in geosynchronous orbit if we were on <laughs> a, a flat plane, but, you know, I guess that's just me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a flat earther. I'm, I'm a hollow earther, to be fair. I think it's all on the inside of the sphere, so so totally not 
flat. No, I, I don't know. I actually, I don't know. I can't really say. I tend to believe it's a globe, but I can never really be too sure. I really can never really be too sure how, how far the gaslighting goes. I guess I believe in round earth for the sake of argument, but... But yeah, no, it's it's uh that's the world we live in right now. They said the word of the year in 2016 was post truth, and I think that's really where we are. You can't can't trust anybody. Trust not even yourself. But well, yeah, that I always found that amusing that a lot of uh, prominent figures on the left tried to poke fun at that yeah. people's mindsets. You had Stephen Colbert saying things like truthiness or truthfulness or whatever it was, his little take on that, or John Oliver and all the others. You know, all you know these people believe anything and they don't believe the truth and all of this, but. You look at the mindset now after it's still up for a few years, and you've got world leaders and the heads of corporations saying things like fake news. So I, I think it's kind of proliferating. You know, I think it's it's reaching more people that, you know, we, we get lied to quite a bit and uh, maybe not just take everything at face value. Yeah, well, I don't know why people would. I mean, that's the thing is I, I'll talk to my friends, I'll talk to my family, and I'll present them with my views on certain historical events or tragedies, you know, whatever. And I, well, it doesn't quite happen the way they say it did, you know? And people say, what are you talking about? What are you crazy? What are you conspiracy? There is that kind of thing. And, and to me, the go-to is always, no, you're right. I believe everything the government tells me. I believe everything exactly down to the most minute detail that the government says. The government would never lie. There is no difference in the information that we, the public, have and the NSA and the CIA. There's no difference. Why would they lie? You know, and that, I think, usually puts it in perspective for people, which is to say that is effectively what we do. We, we have this culture of, well, you should question everything, uh, doubt, be a skeptic. And yet we take everything we hear in school for granted. We take everything we see in television for granted, everything we hear from our government for granted. And if you doubt it, you're a bad person, you're a nut, you're a loon. But you have to do it. You have to doubt everybody, not just Alex Jones, but the people that have a vested interest in lying to you, like politicians. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that that's very true. Everybody seems to have kind of an invested interest. And, you know, one of the more fascinating things to me would be the last three or four years, even even longer than that, to be honest of, uh, you know, th there's a conversation relating to the deep state, mm. which is just uh, the intelligence community. Right. C uh, you know, CIA, FBI, NSA. But we've seen the, the laws that were passed in regards to what they can do and they can't do. And then we had leak after leak after leak of them wiretapping everything, of putting backdoors in both hardware and software. And, you know, the whole time they're saying, no, 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 trust us, we're not doing that. <laughs> and they're totally doing that. So, you know, I don't know how you can look at that or listen to somebody like, I think it's Applebaum, and others who, who brought this information forward and be like, yeah, no, that that's trustworthy. We should believe what they say. Well, I mean, they were just lying to our face. Yeah, like the in the case of James Clapper, we're, we're not spying on anyone. And then he came out and said, yeah, that was actually the least truthful thing I could have possibly said in that situation. And and it continues. But uh, but anyway, the, the last thing I wanted to get into, I think we've, we've treaded over the pedophiles, the conspiracies. This is the last major topic. This is the big one that nobody's talking about, on the alt-right in particular. We talk about race. We talk about Jewish influence. We talk about all the, the media, the government, the deep state. There is one pernicious actor in the world that people are kind of afraid to talk about. I've been very strong in this question, and that is the woman question. And I wanted to pick your brain on this. We had... In our circles, we had this big war about women online. It was called the Thought Wars. It started out with Tara McCarthy being a baby, being a retard baby. She was like, oh, people are being mean to me. You have to submit and defend me or else I won't have you on my stream. And then it was Millennial Woes and then it was Southern and you know, all these people. And it's still very much divided. And we see this now, not just in the political movement, but we see it in video games. You were a big part of Gamergate. It, it was in... Uh, like Battlefield 5, it's in Star Wars, it's in Ghostbusters, it's in WWE now. They're doing their all-women pay-per-view. What is your, is it just social justice warriors? Is it feminists? Is it women themselves? Is there an appropriate degree of segregation that must occur? What is your take on this as kind of not an ideological person? What would you say about the woman question? Oh, I, I would say as a blanket statement, uh, women ruin everything. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're, it you're seems cool. that whatever group they come become a part of, the focal point of that group deviates from what it was originally set out to be about and to be only and solely about the woman. Uh, now, that's not to say that women can't be funny or can't be smart or can't lead in some capacity or even be a part of a movement. There are many that do so. 
but I've, I found generally that when women get involved with something, it goes to shit. Yeah. Uh, when women right. get a position of power or a large amount of say in video games, video games go to shit. When they do in comic books, comic books go to shit and movies and everything else you can think of. Uh, you know, I, I think a good example of this would be, wasn't it Millennial? I can't remember who it was, but I always found this funny. There's a video clip of him on a stream about this because Millennial Woes has, uh, you know, uh, some very upfront viewpoints on certain things. And uh, he, he was defending this woman, and maybe it was Terry McCarthy, maybe it was somebody else. I'm sure you'll know who it is once I say the quote. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's sitting there with her, and you know he's, def he's been defending her against all the attacks, and he's on her side. And during the middle of the stream, she looks into the, her little camera and says, I'm a fourth-generation Holocaust survivor. <laughs> yep. And yep. the look that he got on his face, it, went, it was like five seconds that he went through nearly every emotion to why have I supported this woman to holy shit, I look like a massive idiot right now. And I think that about sums it up. I think that about sums up what happens when you side uh, with a woman over uh, a majority. And yeah, that majority could include other women. But, uh, you, you know, again, I know it's family friendly, so people cover your children's <laughs> ears. But don't put pussy on a pedestal would be the, the right way of saying it. Oh, it's aptly put, a apropos for the conversation. I'm glad you answered that way. I know you're cool now. Well, it's, it's true. This is something I've witnessed as well. I think everybody's seen it. And it's not to say that we don't love women. I mean, look, I've always said it. I love women. We respect women. And we want women to do well. But when they enter into male domains, video games, wrestling, you know, whatever, and all these different examples, politics, streams. Now, that's not to say that there's not exceptions. That's not to say that there aren't women who excel in these fields. And and the reason we have to kiss ass and say that kind of thing is because they will bitch us out if they, oh, you're, are you saying that women, well, what about me? You know, that kind of thing. But it's true. By and large, they enter into a male space and they change the dynamic. We see it time and time again. Women get in, and immediately the room is divided. Men want to impress the women. They want to prove themselves. They want to attack other men. Some men want to keep to the core mission, while other men say, well, the woman needs more attention. And it just changes the dynamic. And, and to me, that is so fundamental to civilization. People make a lot of jokes about it, it's, and people understand it intuitively. But it's so important. Our civilization is built on the bedrock of men and women. How do you think you get the next generation through children? It's the union of men and women. And so when that, when that dynamic is not understood, when that dynamic is not respected, the natures of the two components are not respected and affirmed, you have all hell break loose. It's chaos. That's what's happening with the fertility rates, with the culture, with business and everything else. And so to me, that's... That's the most important thing, and I think there are very few people who understand that. It's mostly the shitlords, internet people who are honest, because it's obvious, and we see it, and it's kind of funny, but but we're the only ones that are willing and able to affirm that, because so many people are, are beholden because they've put it on the pedestal, like you say. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we're dealing with a, a culture of confusion. I, mm. I think a lot of people have forsaken traditional values, mm. uh, the, the concept of a traditional home life, you have men and women competing in the same spaces, and it, it just creates an animosity. Uh, it breaks down a uh, family cohesion. You know, so I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. But um, yeah, generally, uh, generally, I would say women ruin everything. Uh, you know, prove me wrong. If you've got a good example of that not happening, pick an entertainment industry. Uh, pick a profession. Pick something <laughs> that they haven't shown up in and completely driven into the dirt. And I'll be, I'll be impressed. I, you know, it really impressed me. Give me two examples because you probably have one on Wikipedia right now that you're waiting to use for this such argument. So give me two, one you don't have ready. <laughs> True. And and think about it. I always ask this question. I say women do not belong in politics because that's, that's my area. And people say, no, what do you do? Yeah, they do. I'm a woman and I think they do. And look, I love women. And if they watch the show, that's great. A lot of women watch the show. But by and large, women do not have political brains. They don't tend to think about politics as thoroughly as men. They just don't choose to. And if they do, they're not quite as creative as men in that area. And people, oh, I disagree with that. Well, point to me a single female philosopher that wasn't for the advancement of women. You know, every every female political philosopher prominent that you could name was only prominent because she was complaining about the oppression of women. And by the way, the same is true with other categories, which I'd like I, I can't really mention. That'd be a little bit more politically incorrect, but 
The same is true of other categories. If you think of who are the most influential, uh, you know, whatever people you can mention. And you don't want to lose that ACLU sponsorship. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> it's, uh, well, not quite the ACLU. Well, maybe the ACLU would cover it. But there are other groups where it's it's all all the, the only reason we know those people that we celebrate in a month or in a day or a week is, uh, well, they were for the advancement of their own people. And, and that's about it. And to me, that's... You know, it's obvious to everybody, but we have to all play along. We have to all pretend. It's basically like a, a group, I don't even know, like group therapy or like a, a group delusion where we pretend we say, hello, you're you're just as good as this as everyone else, you know? And it's, but we all know it's bullshit. We, we see it. We know it. Well, now I see people in your chat uh, countering and saying, what about Thatcher? Well, you know, I'd counter with, what about there Merkel? Go. There, there you, <laughs> you go. Know, right. You want to talk about uh, female politicians. So what about I, May? What about Theresa yeah. May, right? I'll go tit for tat with you on that one. It's uh, in every in every case. And, and sure, they'll point out one token example. Catherine the Great, uh, Joan of Arc. But for every one woman, you could name a thousand men. I mean, we're talking about all of history. And then, oh, well, this one time. And there's exceptions. Of course there's exceptions. But like you said, the rule remains. They ruin everything. The only thing they don't ruin motherhood just look look i know it's a raw deal i know you're getting a very raw deal we pay for everything we fight the wars we build the effing skyscrapers we do the iron work we work in the mines and you stay at home in the air conditioning and look after the kids and you have to bake a pie every once in a while i know you're getting a really raw deal but that's all we're asking i mean is that so much to ask do you think that's too much uh, no, no, I, you know, I, I'm personally a fan of the idea of the, uh, the nuclear family, yeah. you know, the, the nice little suburban home, the white picket fence, the 2.3 kids and the uh, barbecues on Saturdays. I like that ideal. I like that. I like that, that, uh, very much, but it, it's something that's kind of slipped away. And I mean, mm -hmm. we look at modern society with high divorce rates, with unhappy people everywhere, because the emphasis on what a relationship is and the roles that people play in that relationship have been downplayed or, you know, just... Uh, pushed aside any anybody can be anything now right there there are no roles that define us anymore and i think it's created a generation of lost people that mm. are very unhappy and i think women probably are realizing this i think they're getting into the workforce they're graduating college and they're looking around and saying you know what um this kind of sucks maybe maybe being a housewife and a mother and raising children and doing that isn't terrible well right i don't know how people because there's this weird thing that goes on in the 21st century where people tend to look at the white picket fence nuclear family that you describe and they look at it very cynically and and they always use that as an example of what do you want to go back to the 50s what do you want to go back to white picket fence and all that i'm thinking hell yeah who who thinks that what we have now is preferable to what we had then in terms of you look at the cities the cars the architecture Family life, and you, oh, but this is preferable, where people are getting blackout drunk, they're killing themselves, they're on drugs, we've got an invasion on our border. Yeah, who would want the white picket fence? Who would want barbecue on Saturday and going to church on Sunday and all that? Yeah, God forbid, and everybody's wearing a suit and a hat. I don't get it. I don't get it. It's because they don't want to face the reality of what that, you know, the lifestyle that they're currently yeah. living in is like. It's almost a sanitized version that's presented to them. I think the best mm. example of that would be uh, if you go back and watch, I know this is very weird, but if you go back and watch the very first reveal of the Nintendo Switch, there's a scene where she takes her Nintendo Switch, and it's like an urban environment. It's a city, right? And they, there, she goes across to another rooftop, and they're hanging out and having fun, and everybody's yeah. in their 20s, and isn't this great? We're all diverse <laughs> and multicultural. Now go to a real city and see if anybody's doing that. You know, when you break apart the family unit, when everybody's just loving this new urbanized ideal of what, uh, what our life should be. Uh, it, it's nowhere near the fantasy that's presented to most people. It, it kind of sucks. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just, maybe it's the boomer in me that wants that old, uh, you know, kind of suburbia. Uh, but I, I think it's something that we should strive to get back maybe. Yeah. And I, I think it's something we gave up maybe too easily. Well, that's a great point that you make about the commercials. I, I feel the same way. I find myself thinking like, can't my life just be like in the commercials? Can't it just be like where, where everyone's smiling and there's there's rooftop parties where they have like cool kitschy lights? Isn't that fun? And you know, and they're playing their Switch and black Chinese. There's a couple of lesbians hanging out. 
And it's, oh, it's just fine. And we're driving around in our, like, rustic Beetle from the 1960s, Volkswagen Beetle, and having a picnic, and we're taking pictures with an old camera. But it, that's not how, it, what it's really like is women go to a party, they get blackout drunk because they're miserable. Maybe they get raped or something. I, I don't know. That, that tends to happen a lot. Or not, they're, they're just alone drinking wine with their friends, and then they wake up, their mom's been calling them, and they're $100,000 in student loan debt and they don't have a job. Like that's the, that's the contrast. But people want to sell us the former and say, oh, no, no, no. It's actually like that sitcom on television. It's actually like uh, 13 Reasons Why, where everybody's like a really smart and clever, snarky bitch. Oh, oh, wait, was, there, was 13 Reasons Why, was that the one where the chick guilt tripped people after killing herself by sending yeah. out answering machine or machine messages to everybody <laughs> yeah. about how guilty they were for this? Yeah, she set up an elaborate, like, I don't even know. I'm watching, I'm thinking, this is absurd. How could anybody watch this? I just love the fact, that's so narcissistic. I love the fact that this chick wanted the final word so mm. bad, she kills herself and then sends out messages blaming everybody that nobody can respond to. It's your fault. You were mean to me in the hallway. I would have, I would have burned that tape and pissed on her grave. What are you doing? <laughs> well, and the best is that she sets up this, like, elaborate plan that unfolds over the course of it's like dominoes falling down and finally the plan is revealed and i'm watching this where there's like these teenagers and they're in high school does anybody remember any high schoolers being remotely that interesting intelligent they have something to say give me a break people kill themselves because they get made fun of because like they have a silly hat or if they got caught sleeping with this person you know, the idea that they, oh, they, they put together this this highly sophisticated Rube Goldberg machine of voicemails <laughs> yeah, exactly and photographs. <laughs> Give me a break. Yeah, so ridiculous. It's so elaborate. She plans so much for everything to go meticulously correct. And she's not <laughs> going to be around to oversee it. She's dead after all. But for some reason, it works <laughs> yeah. out just fine. Well, that, that's the funny part, too, is, you know. That the whole point is, why would you even go to that kind of trouble if you're not even get the, gonna get the satisfaction to see it all? Like, like I think people forget that when you die, it's like the story stops there. Like you're you're done. So all this other stuff, not gonna see it. So a very convoluted premise. And, yeah, she uh, could have she could have faked her own kidnapping and at least been around to watch it unfold. You know what I mean, or something right. like that. But no, no, she had to she had to be a drama queen and drink Clorox or whatever she did. I don't remember, but off herself and then send out the messages to make people feel bad. Well, what a weird show that was. That was so bizarre. Well, and so symptomatic of where the youth is at in terms of, I mean, they call it the me generation. Boomers say that a lot, but it's so true where the premise is, I, you should feel bad for me. Nobody's feeling bad for me. I'm not getting enough attention. Therefore, I will kill myself to get attention. And then I will make, I will make people feel bad that they didn't pay attention to me, that they didn't feel bad for me. And then you see people behave like this all the time. It's I see it all the time on Twitter.com. The cries for help, the cries for attention. It's a very pathetic, sad, lost generation. And I blame the boomers. I blame Generation X. I blame them all. There you go. You know, I, I saw some people in chat bringing this up. I, I don't know how you are for time if you got a few more minutes here. but Yeah, for sure. Um, they were bringing up uh, and Nick Atheist Confirmed. I guess you're going a little too hard on that. <laughs> I, I did want to get your perspective on this, though. I mean, given your stance on the pedophilia kind of thing and Hollywood mm -hmm. and all of that. I know you're a good Catholic boy, correct? That's right. Great Catholic, now, yeah. What was your what was your stance on how the church, the pope, handled uh, their issue with pedophilia, kind of the cover up that took place over 50 years? I mean, what what is your position on that? Oh, it was a very disappointing thing to see. I think what the Catholic Church has really seen since Vatican II, if you want to if you want to really get into context, I think a lot of people are disappointed the way the church handled that. I it was really kind of before my time. I don't mean that as a cop out, but I mean you got to remember I became like a conscious human being in like 2012. That's when I started. Oh, this is you know I'm in the world, you know. But but looking back, it's very unfortunate. It's disappointing the way that was handled. And the Catholic Church has been a tremendous disappointment in everything they've done for 50 years. What they've done for 50 years is tried to accommodate the modern world, is tried to accommodate people's sensibilities in this day and age. And that's largely separate from pedophilia, but I think it gets at the same point that 
It's unfortunate that the church leadership has failed the doctrine. The human beings that who are fallible, who are sinners, that run the church have really, I think, let down and been a disappointment for Catholics who want to see the doctrine spread. I'm a Catholic not because I'm the biggest fan of Pope Francis and Pope Benedict and all these people. I'm a Catholic because I believe that Jesus Christ established the church by building the church on the rock, which was Peter, and that his successors are the vicars of Christ on earth. And so that's what brought me to the Catholic faith, was realizing that and thinking about that system. But then I see the leadership and I say, it's it's been in many ways a big letdown for people that want to see Catholicism spread without these horrible distractions, without these horrible missteps and cover-ups and, and the appeal to modernism. So I think I've been disappointed. I will say, in defense of the church, that the rate of pedophilia is, I believe, the same or lower than in other religious institutions. People will point, oh, well, there's many pedophiles. Well, you have to understand that the Catholic Church is a global organization. They've got churches on every continent, in every country. And so there were, I mean, there were significant circumstances there. But if you look at the rate compared to how many there are, it was actually less than other religious institutions. That said, the big problem was they let homosexuals into the clergy. You know there's a big problem between homosexuals and pedophiles. It's no coincidence they start letting in homosexuals and then there's pedophiles. And that goes back to the appeasement of modernism. So it's just, it's very unfortunate. Now, with that said, um, you know, kind of the stance on this. Now, can you begrudge the Protestants for their Reformation? I know it wasn't pedophilia, right, Martin, but, you know, the, the idea that the church was absolving sins for profit. I mean, that you, you can probably see where they're coming from with why they'd have an issue with that. I, I definitely understand where they're coming from. I, I absolutely do. Um, and the trick with faith, this is kind of the misconception about faith. People say, well, faith means that you believe in something that you can't see. That's actually not true. We, the believers, know that God is real. The faith comes in that if God tells us one thing and we don't understand it or it's hard for us to wrap our heads around, we have to have faith that it is correct and carry it out. In the case of the Protestants, they have to have stronger faith and say Christ established a church. He would protect that church from error. He would protect that church from going against what he would want in matters of doctrine. Uh, But they saw some of the corruption that went on. And I don't deny that there was corruption. I don't deny that there have been popes who have not been the best representatives of Christ and his message, but you have to have faith. That's where faith comes in. I mean, there's a lot of people nowadays, they call them, what do they call them? Sede vacantists, where they say, well, all the popes have been false popes going back 100 years or 200 years or whatever. And it really has to be about faith that if you believe in Christ, you believe in his word, you believe in his church, Well, you have to stick with the church, even in times where you don't agree with everything that's going on, even though there's corruption. And there's been corruption in the church for 2,000 years, but it's never interfered with the doctrine. So it's a fair question. It's a fair question, and it's one that people ask a lot. Well, now you're bringing up fake popes, and I've got to ask you, what do you put any stock into? Is it St. Malachi or Malachi, uh, the prophecy of the popes? What what was your take on that, given your current pope? Not right on. And that the the, the things of God as they have gone. You know, I don't believe that is, I don't believe that's totally part of the Catholic doctrine. So I'm not a subscriber to that, uh, to that book or the prophecies in there. Um, I just don't think it's legitimate, but I, I guess we'll see what happens, right? I know there's some pretty harrowing prophecies about what's to come. And I, I know there is a lot of people will say there's a lot of congruence there. Um, but I guess we'll see, you know, it's tough to say. I, I believe because, you know, like I said, I'm a big believer that, Christ lived, died, was resurrected, and that his word, his doctrine has been protected. And I I understand there's always this kind of rush to say, well, there's similarities here, and people read into kind of these doomsday prophecies. I don't totally buy into that kind of thing, but uh, I guess we'll see what happens, right? I mean, do you buy into the Malachi stuff or no? Um, I'm not Catholic, so Mm -hmm. I guess it wouldn't be fair to give uh, too much uh, of an opinion on this because, again, who cares what a Protestant thinks, right? (laughs) Right. Um, But, you know, I don't like your current pope very much. I mean, either, Um, right? I I think a lot of what he says goes against doctrine and dogma. I think a lot of what he says goes against the church and just the faith itself. Um, He's made some statements I've heard others explain away, but that (laughs) they resonate false with me, I guess. Um, him talking about uh, just, you know, anybody can get into heaven, basically, and shit like that um, irks me uh, when it comes to the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Me too. I, me I would too. think he would be um, 
I, I think it would be more traditional in his approach to that, because I'm pretty sure Jesus said that what that wasn't the case. You can't just be a cool dude and get in. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's something uh, my mom one time we were driving to go out to dinner and she she was like, oh, look, check out this video. She pulled it up on Facebook and it was that little boy who went up to the Pope and said, oh, my dad was an atheist and he just died. Is he going to go to heaven? And the Pope was like, well, he was a good man, so he's going to heaven. And my mom was like, isn't that so nice? I'm like, that's borderline heretical. You should not be saying that. So believe me, I hear you. I, I know where you're coming from. And it's very difficult for us Catholics because we believe in the church as an institution and we believe in Peter. And sometimes the popes are, are not great approximations of that. And I will say he wasn't speaking infallibly when he said that. that that's kind of, It's a technicality, but it is true. But uh, I I hear where you're coming from. Uh, that, 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 that you you're right. I mean that is correct. But I, I don't know from from my viewpoint the the throne of Peter I, I would say is uh, vacant with the current guy you've got there. Now maybe uh, maybe the Catholics will get together and exile him. I, I don't remember what it's called exactly. I know you have a way to unpop. Excommunicate. Somebody. Yeah. Well, uh... Yeah. Uh, you can unpop him if he goes too far overboard. But I, I guess I kind of find this interesting. What would be what would he have to do to make you say, OK, uh, that I, I'm calling it. I, I've got to take a step back here. Like, what would he have to come out and say for you to be like, we've got a real problem? Well, and, and that would be very easy if he spoke in his powers as infallible, if he contributed to the magisterium and he he was invoking his powers of infallibility. And he said something that went against doctrine or scripture, overturned pre-existing doctrine I would have to say it would really cause a crisis of faith because the whole the whole point of why we believe in the papacy is because the doctrine has apostolic succession. It's never been reversed. It's been changed. It's been tweaked, but it's never been reversed. And if that was if something was reversed, if he spoke against scripture, if it was something that was wrong, um, that obviously that would that would throw into question the foundation of the religion, which is that the Pope is infallible, that he is truly the vicar of Christ. So if that happened, and, and people say all the time, well, he said this, he said that. Well, people can say things. He is still a, he's still a mortal man, and people can say things. But if he invoked the infallibility and he said something fallible, I don't think you could recover from that. I got you. Oh, what, what did, just by the way, what did you think of the, uh, the show uh, The Young Pope? I didn't watch it. I've seen clips of it. Um, uh, now, you, know. you, you, you might like that. I mean, I yeah. know it comes off a certain way when you're watching the advertisements for it, right. but he's, he's very uh, hardline traditional. Yeah, well, and I, I like that. Yeah, I, I think like in the that. first episode, if I remember, it's like the first or second episode, he talked about uh, the problem with the modern church being that it, it, it's trying too hard to net people in, that it's becoming too open door, that it's tolerating everything rather than adhering to its traditional values and viewpoints. So his his solution to that was to close the doors, to make it mysterious again, to cut off access to people. That's why he wouldn't appear in public and do you know things like that. I thought it was an interesting show. I just didn't know if you'd watched it or not. Yeah, no, it's, I saw that, uh, that monologue that he gave. I've seen some of the clips. He, the problem is, is that he's prideful. You know, as a Christian, you look at that character. He's not exactly Christ-like, but that kind of leadership, that kind of tone... I think is what's necessary for the Catholic Church at this point because it's true since Vatican II, and that's the correct diagnosis. We have been too willing to appease, to appeal to the modern world, to to a satanic world order. You know, if Christ saw what was going on today, he would be turning over tables like he did in the temple. He would be he'd be doing what he did in that case, and we don't see that from the Pope. We see an appeasement. We see he tries to get along. He tries to be liked. At least that's my interpretation, and that's. That's not the way it should go. So I, we're on the same page. It's just, you know, I, I think we are on the same page in terms of we see that there is definitely something wrong there. It puts a bad taste in our mouth, but you happen to believe that that is delegitimizing. I believe that unless certain conditions are met, it's still legitimate. Why? Well, I, I know Catholics are very faithful. That, that's got to, you know, I don't get a chance to talk to a lot of Catholics. So that's kind of what I was curious to pick your brain a little bit on that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, no, you, you want to throw you want to throw your opinion out on Mormons? I'm just <laughs> wait. Are you are you a Mormon? No. Fuck oh. No. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I always have to clarify in case I ever want to want, run for president. I can't go after Mormons too hard. Um, but it's it's a little bit hocus pocus to me as a Catholic. I mean, you look at the Joseph Smith and the stuff that went on, and they can become gods, and they have to wear the special underwear and. Maybe it's because I don't understand it totally. You know, granted, I haven't read the Book of Mormon in its uh, in its entirety, but it's 
I can't really wrap my head around it, you know? Uh, what do you uh, think? It, it, there, there's some wild stuff in there about uh, Native Americans being Jews uh, from Egypt 6,000 years ago. Just some really crazy stuff in that book. Yeah, I, I've read a little bit of it for a laugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely something different. I mean, I respect their faith, but I, I don't think it is Christian. I, I can't say that it is because it, it's not scriptural. You know, if I just made up my my own book and I said, this is the book of Nick. And it says uh, cat boys and optics and, you know, maybe I'll do that. Who knows? People might come to my commune and work for me. I don't know. But uh, I, I can't really wrap my head around how that would be. You know, Jesus Christ never said anything about that. So a little, little he, off. He, he omitted that. Uh, I can't They had an excuse for why that, uh, why some <laughs> things weren't talked about. But you can read about it from the golden tablets that Joseph dug up. That's right. When, and so you're a Protestant. Are you are you just a mainline Protestant or what, what particular oh, sect are you? Yeah, well, I, I, I should have said raised Protestant. Mm, I, I'm more okay. of an apatheist, a kind of a disinterest one way or the other at this okay. point. Um, but, I, you know, I grew up in a, a good Lutheran family, <laughs> sure. um, you know, a, a typical Protestant upbringing, um, went to church every Sunday, I did all of that. Um, I enjoyed it. I mean, I like the community aspect of it. You know, uh, we kind of focused around it. I guess, uh, you know, you'd go to church, you'd go out and have a lunch afterwards, people from the community would get together and do things. And I like that. And, I, you know, I think that that kind of, again, is something that's missing kind of in the, the context of a modern America. It's something that's kind of disappeared, not just, re- you know, uh, through religion, but just through multiple avenues. We don't have a sense of community or neighborhood anymore. You know, We're people right. are, are kind of separated and just uh, isolated from one another through their technology and their apathy and everything else. Uh, that it's just, it's a mess. You're, you're right, it's horrible. It's the number one crisis that's facing the country. Forget taxes, forget trade. I mean, th- these things are important, but you're so right. It's we've lost the soul of the nation. We we don't know who we are. We don't know who our neighbors are. We don't know our neighbors. And it's not, it, you cannot really classify it as a society. It's just like a collection of people all living together and, and doing business, all all exchanging goods and labor. But you cannot call it a society. You cannot call a nation, a community. And it's, uh, it's a travesty. Who knows how to rebuild something like that? I mean, you need it to happen, I guess, piece by piece. But you certainly can't do it if you don't speak the same language, if you don't, you're not from the same place, don't have the same mannerisms, God, etc. So it's a mess. But I, I guess we'll leave it on that black pill. I got to get to some Super Chats and Streamlabs. But... I, I will let you get to the. I will let you get to the money chats. Uh, thank you for having <laughs> me on. I, I had a good time. It was a nice conversation. Absolutely. Hey, me too. We should do it again sometime. Thanks so much for joining us. I, I know our audience enjoyed it, and uh, and we'll see you around. Okay. Have a great rest of your evening. Yeah. Anytime you want to invite me back, just uh, send me a link, and I'll I'll pop on. I had a good time. Have a good Excellent. night. You too, big guy. Take it easy. All right. All 